I shall I start now? All right. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for our fourth talk of this term. We are proud to welcome Professor um, Tom Oliver for this talk, and I will introduce him in a minute. Um, before we start, there's um, I would like to just read some messages from our sponsors. So um, one of our sponsors is Bitbio, which was founded by Dr. Mark Cotter and Florian Schuster. Bitbio is an award-winning human synthetic bio biology enterprise whose mission is coding cells for health. To do so, they apply the principles of computation to biology. Their current focus is to develop a scalable technology platform capable of producing consistent batches of every human cell. We would like to also thank another sponsor, CRISPR Biotech Engineering, an early stage genome editing company using CRISPR-Cas9 to develop immunogenomics-based therapies, as well as providing um, educational resources. Today, we are honored to have Professor Tom Oliver as our speaker. He is a professor at um, professor of applied ecology at the University of Reading, leading the ecology and evolution research group. He is a prominent system thing, systems thinker, advising both the UK government and the European Environment Agency. He has published more than eighty scientific papers in world leading interdisciplinary journals and won two first place prizes for essays communicating science to a broader to a broader audience. His writing has appeared in The Guardian, Independent, and BBC Science Focus, and he is author of the critically acclaimed book The Self Delusion: The Surprising Science of Our, of our Connection to Each Other and the Natural World. Um, for this interactive talk, um, we will be, it will involve live voting using Slido. Um, so yeah, as you can see, uh, we will be posting the Slido link in a minute. And then Professor Oliver will be asking some questions during the talk. So it would be nice if you could respond to the chat, uh, to the talk, uh, sorry, the questions um, via the Zoom chat. Um, and after the talk, it, we will have a Q&A session as usual, and the session will be moderated by Shreyas, so um, you could send your questions again using the Zoom chat, either to, uh, to Shreyas privately, or you could send it um, you know, just to everyone. So um, yeah, without further ado, let's welcome Professor Oliver to give his talk. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you for, for inviting me. I'm, I'm aware there's, there's, you know, loads of talks you can go to now and online talks on the other side of the world. So um, great stuff out there. And it's, uh, you know, so I'm honoured that you've made the time to come and listen to this. I'm going to try and make it a little bit different, um, a little bit interactive. So I hope it works. Um, you know, there's always a risk that technology doesn't work or, or more likely that I can't work the technology properly. So let's, let's see how it goes. So, of course, I'm going to talk about um, the self-delusion today. And, uh, yeah, this is the most garish psychedelic slide of the talk. Um, my six-year-old daughter helped me put together yesterday. Um, the the self-delusion is the, uh, I would argue, it's, it's a harmful illusion, which is um, uh, a harmful illusion, which is, you know, causing a whole range of mental health problems. And it's, I'm gonna to talk today, taking a very interdisciplinary lens. So looking at topics from biology, sustainability, psychology, and also this last one about practice and introspection. Um, the reason for taking an interdisciplinary perspective, uh, here's some words from your, uh, one of your emeritus professors, Peter Burke, from Emmanuel College, talking about interdisciplinary research being important to mine the gap and draw attention to the knowledges that may otherwise disappear into the spaces between disciplines as they are currently defined and organized. So, you know, it's this idea that insights might fall in between the cracks of, of our disciplines. And actually, you know, we really need to build the bridges between the disciplines to tackle some of these big systemic problems that we face. So sometimes, you know, interdisciplinary scientists might get accused of being superficial, although there's no reason really why you can't get 
quite deeply into several topics. Um, you know, a dilettante is the sort of derogatory term you might use for someone who's, you know, a superficial level of knowledge. But actually, many of these systemic problems that I mentioned, you know, things like climate change, biodiversity loss, um, obesity, pandemic risk, they all need a much more integrated holistic approach to really get at some of the root causes and develop some of the root, you know, the deeper solutions, as I guess, to these to these problems. So rather than being superficial, actually, it's essential to take this, this bigger picture approach to get to more deeper solutions, the deeper intervention points, which allow you to transform the system. And today, um, as, as was mentioned it's going to be a bit interactive so here's a bit of a practice to um you can click on the link in the in the zoom chat which will or you can go to slido and add the code it's easier probably just to click the link in the in the zoom chat here when you've got that that voting page up um you can keep it up for the whole talk and flick between it because it's the same page essentially that the, the polls will update themselves and um if you're on a laptop or a computer alt tab is a nice button actually alt tab is a shortcut that allows you to flick between the two screens which is quite nice the presentation and the voting so the first question really is just to let you i guess decide the flow of the talk because um you know i've had my own path to get to some of these these um, ideas about the self delusion but obviously there are other disciplines as well but even these disciplines you could take them in a different pathway you know uh, you might study one you might study them sequentially or you might study different disciplines in parallel uh, one might be a hobby one might be more professional uh, you know degree type um, exploration of a topic so if if you're happy to just um, add your add your um, your response to the poll I guess it's a bit like those books um, I don't, have you ever read those adventure books where you get to the end of a, a, a chapter and it says you know if the hero is to follow the deep path through the forest, go to page 67. If the hero should climb the cliff uh, and take the mountain pass, go to page 73. Um, obviously the author had some kind of overall idea of, of what you would get from the story, but the, the different pathway you, you might take through that book, I always find that intriguing as to the, the different kind of experience you might have and maybe the different insights you might get. So looking at the poll now, it looks like uh, perhaps not surprising to a, um, an audience of biologists. We've got biology as number one, and psychology as number two, and sustainability as number three. Okay, just going to write that down so I don't forget. Okay, so ah, okay, let's step on to biology then. Just give me a moment. Okay. okay. So hopefully you can see that now. So let's start off here. I want you to take a deep breath. Let's um, sit back in your chair if you're sitting down. Take a deep breath and feel the air going into your lungs. And I just want you to think now, and you can add it to the Zoom chat, any responses. You know, what is the composition of that air? As you, you take a deep breath in, breathe out. What are, you, what are you breathing in there? What is the composition of that air? I mean, feel free to just chuck a few answers in. Um, I mean, obviously, we've got things like carbon dioxide, nitrogen. Um, as part of that air that you're breathing in, any any other suggestions as to what's in there? So, one of the uh, things in that air, I guess, might be a good answer here. We've got 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% other. So very specific answer, excellent. So the 1% other I'm interested in here as well, you know, there might be, I suppose, uh, pollutants, um, chemicals from car tires, from domestic stoves causing air pollution, depending on where you are in the country. Um, inert gases, excellent. Bacteria, viruses, yes, these are the topics I wanna to get into. Viruses, dust, yeah. So that you're breathing in dead skin, excellent. Um, lots of organic molecules and those molecules come from, you know, plants, animals, dinosaurs that have lived before. So just to explore that a little bit, I want you to um, think of about 40 kilograms of, 40 to 50 kilograms of oxygen, which are in your body right now, if you're an average sized person. So I want you to imagine those uh, oxygen molecules. Right now they're packed densely in your body. Obviously we don't all float around, which, um, 
which would be nice, but those oxygen molecules are bound closely with, with water molecules, uh, sorry, with hydrogen. To, uh, the, the dense intermolecular forces you know, make those water molecules of, of a higher density. But when we, we pass away, you know, if we're buried in the soil and our body starts to decompose, or if we're, we're crema cremated, and those, those um, molecules burst into the atmosphere, let's just imagine that now all the molecules of oxygen in your body, that 40 to 50 kilograms, were to, to burst forth. And let's just imagine them now um, entering the atmosphere. So those molecules are going to uh, spread out into the Earth's atmosphere. So if you imagine an, an area 100 kilometers high stretching around the entire Earth, and uh, you can add your answers to the chat here or your estimates, I guess, in terms of if each of those oxygen molecules in your body were to spread equally amongst the Earth's atmosphere, how far apart would the average molecule be? How far apart would they be? So that's 40, 50 kilograms of oxygen. No answer here is a wrong answer. Just chuck in a few guesses. Um, so we've got 40, 50 kilograms of oxygen in your body and it bursts out and it spreads. That, that line around the atmosphere is, uh, is called the carbon line. It's, it's uh, just the arbitrary line that we define the edge of the atmosphere, 100 kilometers high, spread around the entire Earth. So we've got an estimate here of one kilometer. Any, anyone want to go below that? A few kilometers, we're going up one meter. Okay, so the actual answer is about 0.3 millimeters apart. So in any one meter cube, you could take it from anywhere in the Earth's atmosphere. One meter cube would have 29 million molecules of oxygen that were once in your body. So a dense fog of, of molecules that were in your body intermingling with a dense fog of molecules that once part of other uh, animals, you know, shrews, wallabies, whales, dolphins. When you take a deep breath, you're breathing in a zoological legacy. You're also breathing in molecules that were once part of uh, all those other animals, but also bacteria as well. As, as someone mentioned in the in the, the chat bar, where um, our bodies uh, contain lots of bacteria. Um, sorry, and uh, you know when we shed about a million microscopic particles every hour into the air, so that those those um, bacteria go into the air, and you're you're breathing in the uh, the bacteria that are part of other people. Of course, those bacteria. There's loads on our body. The, there's about 440 bacterial species in between your elbow joints. If you open your mouth, there's about a thousand bacterial species in there. Behind your ears, about 150 species, depending on how often, uh, oft, often you wash. And of course, inside your body, uh, deep inside there are bacteria in our guts. I'm sure you've all read about the influences those uh, our microbiome has upon our emotions and our moods. You know, how you feel today might depend on, upon your, your microbiome. Uh, and what you fed it, essentially. Um, so those bacteria are, are deeply part of us. We have actually the same, almost the same, actually slightly more bacterial cells in our body, 38 trillion bacterial cells to our 37 trillion human cells. But actually, even inside our, our bacterial, our human cells, sorry, we have mitochondria, of course, uh, which are um, organelles, the powerhouses of the cells producing the energy. And those organelles, those uh, mitochondria derived from single celled bacteria, which were then uh, engulfed uh, to become uh, a cell, a eukaryotic cell, which then goes on to form uh, uh, animal cells and our human cells. So, you know, uh, interwoven through us are these bacteria. We're a, we're a chimera of, of human and bacterial cells. And, oops, sorry, let's go back a little bit. <clears throat> you can see a nice quote here from Lynn Margulies, the founder of uh, endosymbiotic theory, talking about uh, evolution and how it connects uh, life together. Those bacteria in our body, I mean, if you hold out your hand right now, above, it, above your hand in the air, are bacteria. As I said, there's a there's a microbial cloud around you. Actually, it's a unique microbial cloud. If you take some DNA sampling and, and you can analyze that cloud, it's your unique fingerprint that you can detect someone's identity from that microbial cloud. Um, and those bacteria, whether they're on our skin or in our hands, you know, they're actually, they're not so alien. They're actually related to us quite closely. Um, you know, all of us on this Zoom call, we share more than 99% of our, of our genetic code. 
and you, you, you know you share 95% with chimpanzees, but you actually share 37% share with bacteria. So that bacteria floating above your hand, inside it is a genetic code, which is not just similar, but the same genetic code. 37% of that code is exactly the same as, as in your human cells. So we're, we're deeply uh, you know, connected to the, you know, across the web of life. And, and genes, of course, um, pass horizontally across that web of life as well, vectored by viruses. So about 125 of our 20,000 genes, I gather, are, um, oh, sorry, 145 of our human genes have, have been transported horizontally across the tree of life. So physically, you know, hopefully it starts to sort of break down that illusion that our bodies are discrete you know, isolated entities. Of course, you know, we stand in a mirror and it looks like us, this is me. But actually, you know, there's a huge turnover in that body. The cells are in our, in our skin or our, you know, guts are with us just for several weeks. And the body is continually rebuilding itself from materials scavenged from the environment. And so it's the DNA, of course, that's the architect that's containing the instructions for this body. But that DNA is simply borrowed from our ancestors and we'll pass it on to our ancestors to come. So, you know, physically, we're, we're, we're hugely interconnected. So then you might say, well, okay, well, it's not the body that defines me, it's, it's what's inside here, it's, it's in my head, that's, that's me, isn't it? That's, that's my persistent self. But actually every, um, every word, every uh, touch, every uh, smell changes the neural network in our brains and, and it changes the person that we are. So you're not the same person that you were last year, but equally you're not the same person that you were, you know, one hour ago or 10 minutes ago. Every word we hear is, you know, changing the connections in our brain and, and the, the boundaries of our, of our minds are much more porous than we initially think. So just to give you an example, um, you know, let's think about inventors. We like to think of, of geniuses. We have this story that we tell ourselves of geniuses as kind of lone, lone wolves inventing things. But actually, you know, things like the incandescent light bulb, thermometer, hypodermic needle, all these things were invented in multiple locations, um, either several weeks apart or in some cases patents filed on the same day. So actually, you know, inventors aren't just great minds. They're actually almost taking the inevitable next step in a series of interdependent innovations. And creativity is part of one great linked human endeavor. So actually the, the you know, our bodies are much more physically connected. Uh, they're not isolated entities. We, we're part of a web of, of web of genes, deeply interlinked. And our minds are, are porous and deeply connected to other minds with, with information flowing freely back and forth, a, a web of memes, if it were. So actually, from a biological point of view, the idea of a, of a kind of independent self is, is clearly an illusion. So I'm gonna um, move on now to the next topic, which was going to be um, psychology, was it? Someone remind me if I'm wrong, it was psychology, yeah, okay. So, let's just uh, move this a sec. So we, we're gonna move on to another vote shortly. But firstly, I just want you to consider the nature of an illusion, okay. So here's an illusion. <coughs> this is called the Penrose uh, Staircase. Um, or the infinite stairs. And it's made famous by, Roger, well, developed by Roger Penrose, made uh, more famous by M.C. Escher, the, um, with the beautiful sort of line drawings. And if you put your finger on the screen, don't damage your screen here, but if you put your finger on the bottom and you follow the staircase up to the right, it's going up and then it's going up to the left. And then you go up the stairs again, and then finally come back up the stairs to where you start now, obviously, we know you can't keep going upstairs and come back to where you started. That's the nature of the illusion. We perceive it to be one way, but actually that's not true. And I would argue that our sense of self as, as discrete, autonomous, persistent entities is such an illusion. And the reason it's so persistent and the reason that we, you know, we might uncover it sometimes 
but then our mind flips back to seeing it the same way because we've evolved a certain way of perceiving the world, just like we see a certain illusion and we, we always fall for it even when we turn back and, and look back to it because that's just the way our perception has evolved. And I would argue that the sense of self is, is a similar evolved, um, evolved illusion, essentially. Um, if you think back to, you know, where, where, where the conditions that we evolved, you know, in groups of maybe 50 or 100 people, we needed to have a sense of self. In fact, of course, we still do need to have a sense of self. And, and don't take my arguments the wrong way here. I'm not talking about abolishing our sense of self in any way. It's actually about reappraising our sense of self and understanding where the boundaries truly are. So, you know, back in hunter-gatherer times, you know, imagine you have a sense of self and you need that because it's like, you know, it's, it's an adaptation. It allows you to find food and remember where that food is. It allows you to keep your memories in a coherent bundle. It allows you to track your, your complex social interactions. Who said who about what? Who said what does so-and-so think about what so-and-so thinks about this other person? You know, there's a huge amount of information that needs to be tracked there. And a sense of self allows you to uh, manage those social interactions. But if you are too selfish uh, and you take that too far down, if you imagine a continuum between, you know, collective, more collectivist uh, group sense of identity versus one which is much more atomistic and individualistic. If you go too far down that spectrum and you start being selfish, you know, stealing food from the group or, or whatever, then everyone's looking out. And you know, if I steal food from the group and I get spotted, then uh, I get punished you know I'd be physically beaten or I wouldn't be able to mate or I get excluded from the group and, which obviously threatens my survival so there's a huge you know pressure checks and balances which prevents us going too far down that that individualistic side and becoming selfish and it maintains that that cooperation within the group now if we zoom forward to the modern day you know we don't interact with groups of just 100 people or 150 people or 100,000 people, we can interact now with people, you know, 8 billion people digitally, you know, we're, we're, we're hugely connected in that sense. So the checks and balances are now lifted, if you think of it, in the sense that our economies have become globalized. You know, I can impact something on the other side of the world. Uh, I can cause damage uh, by what I choose to buy at the click of a button, you know, can cause ripple effects which create you know the destruction of a patch of rainforest um, you know damaging habitat for orangutans maybe having social impacts on people so our economies have become globalized but our moral frameworks are still the same ones that we had you know that we, we evolved so actually they've become maladaptive in the modern world because those damages, when, we, when our economies become bigger and, and our impacts become globalized, we actually need to become more aware and we need our group identity to extend in a commensurate way. But actually it hasn't. And it's maladaptive in the modern world to have this very individualistic sense of self-identity. Many of the problems that it causes, whether it's climate change, uh, leading to mass human migration, whether it's air pollution or whether it's ocean pollution, you know, these are transboundary problems. They simply come back and bite us. So we, we don't solve any problems with this individualistic identity. Obviously, this is not all about biological evolution as well. Culture has a massive role in, you know, how we feel about ourselves, what, what our sense of identity is. Um, if you think about things like media, you know, these adverts telling you because I'm worth it or education, you know, real emphasis on building self-esteem in our Western education. Government, Margaret Thatcher famously saying there's no such thing as um, uh, in, there's no such thing as society, only individuals and their families. So you, you can see that these, all these factors combine and our culture is, you know, our minds are like sponges and they soak up this culture and it changes the way we think. So we've got this combination, we've got evolution having a tendency for us to have this sense of, of individualistic self, but it's been exacerbated even further by, by evolution. And here are the consequences. Um, you can see uh, some trends in individualism. What we've got here are the maps are showing change in individualistic practices and values um, from Henry Santos's work. Uh, the blue colors show 
increases in individualism, basically. Uh, the, you know, the only outlier here is, well, a couple of outliers, but a, a major one being China in individualistic values. But you can see the majority of countries have become more individualistic over time. Similarly, at the extreme end of individualism is narcissism, where we, you know, knowingly can hurt other people and for our own gain. <laughs> and there's lots of nuances in these studies. For example, a lot of these studies are done on, on university campuses. Um, and there's variation among campuses in terms of the average levels of narcissism. But overall, the trends tend to be having been increasing over time. And there's even studies of things like, you know, the use of individualistic words or phrases in songs or in books. I just pulled this data here um, from Google Engram Viewer. This is the phrase, all about me. You can see it's increased massively over time. Now, obviously, there, again, there are nuances here. Maybe a certain phrase was only kind of invented more recently, so it's not used earlier on. But they do this with lots of different types of, of words that relate to possession or, or a sense of egoism. And they see that these have massively increased over time as well. So what should we do about it? We could, um, well, I was going to say this, this, this slide here was to remind me to talk about an analogy, but actually it's just making me hungry because it's about five o'clock and, uh, uh, and, and it was to talk about the dangers of obesity, but actually this burger does look pretty good. Um, now, an analogy here is, uh, um, is fast food, and it's a nice way to think about these problems where you have a trait which is, was adaptive it, when we evolved back in the past. You know, it's, a, it's our tendency to seek out fatty, high energy foods, fatty or sugary foods, or both. Um, but actually in the modern world where those foods are hyper abundant and where we have culture exacerbating that, you know, the foods are cheaper, um, they're much more accessible. We have advertising making them more apparent and we're very susceptible. And the result of all that combination of, of biology, of, of, our, of our evolved tendency plus culture pushing in the wrong direction has led to two billion people overweight or obese, a quarter of the world's population. That's the problem. But you know, there are ways to deal with that. When we understand the problem, we can obviously try to change culture. We can ban the sort of junk food advertising potentially, or we can put, you know, there's economic changes, uh, taxes or prices we can put on junk food, for example. But, but at a personal level, we can just be aware of those cognitive biases which cause us to act in a certain way, you know, which is not for our, for our long-term benefit of us or society. And in a similar way for the self-delusion, you know, if we, we know we have a tendency to be more ego, ego, you know, have a strong ego, <clears throat> which is being exacerbated by our culture, and it's becoming maladaptive in the modern world, then we do have an option to try to, to overcome that. So <clears throat> just moving on here, there's an, uh, um, if you like to have a go at this um, second poll, if I'm which is asking you to just describe your relationship with, with nature. So, uh, oh, sorry, the poll should be activated now. Okay, great. So I'm just gonna give a moment there, <clears throat> grab a drink. So, what we covered before, I guess, was a bit of, you know, um, evolutionary psychology 101. And, and it's, you know, it's, these are not, it's not my, my specialism. I'm more of a sort of, my professional career is in ecology. Um, we've touched on a bit of environmental psychology. And here we're going to talk about, sorry, talk about evolutionary psychology. Here we're going to touch on environmental psychology. So this question is a one, it's a one question survey. And it's trying to understand, yeah, how, how our self, our sense of self-identity, our self-schema overlaps with, with what we can call nature. And there can be either no overlap panel A or there can be complete overlap panel G. So just um, showing the results there, if I, if I put them across here, you can see that um, there's across the audience, we've got kind of most people somewhere sitting in the middle with a few uh, on D. Uh, one on G saying could be overlap. That's great. I'm, I'm pleased there's no one on A or B because they're the cases that I need to work on a lot more in terms of convincing you that there's this overlap. So in terms of um, this question, 
it's trying to identify this overlap. This is, a, as I said, it's a, just a single question survey. There are a number of other surveys that are much more detailed. They have different names like nature connectedness index or connectedness to nature scale or nature as self index. They all do pretty much the same thing. Um, what's nice actually is these surveys, they also are linked to other um, measures of behavior because these are measuring attitudes. Uh, and worldviews or mindsets, however you might call it. But actually they do link to real behaviors on the ground. Um, they also link to other aspects sort of emotional, um, you know, uh, aspects of our lives. So when people tend to score higher on these surveys of, of connectedness to nature, they tend to be happier. They also tend to have, do more pro-environmental behaviors. So they, you know, they recycle more, they reduce their carbon footprint, they, um, they're more likely to be part of volunteers for nature organizations. So real on the ground changes addressing some of these big global environmental problems come from or can be you know, measured by some of these uh, quantitative assessments of mindsets. There are also other surveys, um, for example, um, related to uh, our social connectedness. And, and it's a different field of psychology, but actually they start to realize that they're, they're measuring very similar things. And when people tend to feel more connected to nature, they also often tend to feel more connected to other people as well. Um, so these social connectedness scales, they also associate with things like happiness, but also our ability to be, you know, to have empathy and also pro-social behaviors. So it's nice to see these uh, links um, for understanding, you know, when you look at a scene in nature, do you see, you know, trees out there as something separate, or do you see that as part of your of your sense of identity? Because actually, you know, it's important, I would argue, to address some of these uh, global problems we face. Is that sense of identity as being distinct and isolated is is actually harming our ability to to solve some of these these environmental problems. Just a little sort of kind of bit of history, I suppose. There was a philosopher called, uh, an ecological philosopher called Arnie Nace, and he developed this field called deep ecology. And Arnie Nace's idea was this, what, what he called ecological self. Um, and it's essentially panel G, you know, the complete overlap between self and nature. And uh, Arnie Nace's idea was that if, we saw ourselves as part of nature, then we're less likely to, to damage nature. And his idea was that, you know, if we have an in-group, you know, an in-group and an out-group, an in-group is, we tend to sort of, it's our team, our tribe, you know, we look after people in the in-group, whether it's our family, whether it's our football team, whether it's our town, whether it's our nation, we tend to look after people in the in-group at the expense of, of the out-group. Arnie Nace's idea was maybe we could expand that in-group to encompass the whole planet, you know, all the people, all the species, all the wildlife, so that we wouldn't actually, you know, asking people to protect something, to do it as an altruistic act, it's hard, you know, it's hard to do that. It's hard to persuade someone to, to protect something else other than them, and it's going to cost them personally. You know, that's quite a hard case to make. But actually, if your self-identity is bigger and encompasses those things, protecting them becomes an act of, of self-care. I mean, think about, you know, your family. You don't, it's not an act of altruism to look after your family. It, it's an act of self-care because they're part of your, your identity. And Nace's idea was that maybe we could expand our self of identity, a bit like on the survey, we can expand our self, sense of self to incorporate all of nature. But actually, this was back in the 70s that he was developing these ideas, and it wasn't clear what, you know, if you could have the benefits of an in-group when there's no out-group to contrast it with, because your in-group is covering the whole planet. But actually years later, these environmental psychology research is starting to show that it, it, Nace was right, essentially. You can quantify people's uh, sense of ecological self, essentially their sense of connectedness to nature, and you can look at the benefits. And it, and it does seem that, you know, as I said, that people, that do feel more connected to nature and have their sense of identity linked as part of it, do tend to be more protective of it. So Nace was was right, and and this environmental psychology research is really booming in the last sort of ten years or so, really starting to quantify in a much more rigorous way using these different metrics, people's attitudes, and their links to sort of real behaviour change on the ground. 
<clears throat> so we've covered um, biology and we've covered psychology. I'm going to move on to uh, sustainability, which was your last um, your last uh, selection here. So uh, just give me a moment to change the slide. I'm going to start off with an, an anecdote. Uh, when I were a lad, or not quite that far back. So sustainability, I'm going to talk about um, this place, which was just up the road. In fact, where I sit, it's probably a mile. And about two or three years ago, uh, I, I walked past this place a lot and it was an abandoned orchard and it was full of um, uh, foxes, hares, butterflies, birds. It was a lovely abandoned orchard. And then I walked past one day and everything had been cut down and all the trees you can see are in these three, these three piles. Um, and now it's, it's an intensive arable field. So it has wheat crops growing and there's like lots of pesticides, lots of herbicides um, uh, and fertilizer, essentially, essentially destroying the biodiversity. So it's become, you know, a biodiversity desert. And our, our wildlife, you know, this kind of, it's a, this is a relatively small field, I guess, in the big scheme of things. It's about four football pitches, four full-size football pitches. But this has happened all over the country, especially after the first, after the Second World War, the rapid sort of tr transformation of our landscape to intensive agriculture. And these, each of these small changes, like a billion, you know, a million small cuts, driving the decline of our, of our wildlife. Um, I, after, I did my PhD. So my, my degree was in zoology, and then I did a PhD in ants and aphids. And then I was lucky enough to get a job studying butterfly populations. And the nice thing about butterflies, besides the fact that they're really pretty, these are three different species that are found all around this area and, and where you are too, if you're in Cambridge or somewhere near there. Um, these uh, butterflies are nice because you get volunteers recording them. So there are over a thousand volunteers go out every week and record butterfly populations across the United Kingdom. And that's the same for bird populations too. So you get really good data and you can use these to try and, you know, essentially measure the heartbeat of the, of the nation's wildlife. So all these lovely species, and I decided to study initially this dull brown uh, one called the ringlet. So the ringlet is, is uh, interesting because it's a drought sensitive species. It likes things moister. It feeds on grasses uh, in sort of woodland at the edges of woodlands, and the ringlet populations crash following a drought. So you can see here a result from this is uh, some of my earlier work on this species. And what's on the left is a kind of an image from a satellite that looks down on on the Earth, and the black line is the transect. Essentially, these transects get walked by volunteers. I was one of these volunteers at one point. <clears throat> you record butterflies. Uh, five meters either side and five meters in front as you walk along this this route um, and you can quantify the landscape at, in in this case it's a one two or five kilometer radii around the, the the center of that transect and you can look at for example the amount of woodland uh, also the fragmentation of woodland in the landscape so these different colors on the map greens and oranges relate to sort of arable or woodland or urban land covers and you can see on the the plot here that what you've got on the, the vertical axis is the abundance change of the butterfly following a drought. So the, the line at zero means no change. And each of these points is a separate population of butterflies. So a huge amount of effort goes into monitoring each one of these every year. But you can see that most populations crash following the drought. But interestingly, the amount of woodland, which is on the horizontal axis, the amount of woodland here affects how they respond. And when there's less woodland in the landscape, the populations tend to be more sensitive to drought. So they crash much more when there's a drought event. Um, they also recover much more slowly when there's a drought event. Um, sorry, when there's less woodland. And not just the area of the woodland matters, the connectivity of the woodland matters. So where the woodland is very fragmented into lots of small patches, the recovery is very slow because you get extinction locally in a certain place and the, the landscape is very fragmented. And so the butterflies can't recolonize easily. And this is a real problem if you get repeated uh, drought events. So this butterfly, I so said there's a question, is, this is the ringlet butterfly, Aphantopus hipparantus is the Latin name, but it's called the ringlet, um, these little rings of, of brown spots. Um, and I also studied um, 
several other drought sensitive species. So this result here, which is in this Nature Climate Change paper, was actually six droughts, um, drought sensitive species. And these are it's quite a conservative estimate, but we picked all the ones that are really susceptible to drought. It's about 10% of the butterfly fauna of the UK. And what you see here is a probability of them persisting in any site drops from about 50% to about 10% when the habitat is much more fragmented. And this is under a climate change scenario. RCP is representative concentration pathway, a bit of a mouthful, but it's how much CO2 we're pumping into the atmosphere. Um, and this is a very benign scenario. Actually, we're on track, scientists on track for the, the eight, the eight, the highest RCP scenario, in which the results are obviously much more severe in terms of the, you know, the extinction rates. But you see here that the fragmentation of these habitats is exacerbating the effects of climate change. So, you know, these butterflies are really in trouble, essentially. So this is a sort of ecological perspective on um, some of the changes that are happening. I've just talked about butterflies, but of course we've got a whole range, we've got 44,000 other species in the UK, and we want to be able to study them. Um, sorry. And the data to actually study those species is not as, uh, as easy to work with. It tends to be less structured. So you get people going out and recording and sending in their biological records. You can do it on your phone. You know, I saw this ladybird and the, the, the grid reference gets sent to the database, but it needs to be verified. And also we don't know how many people are looking for the ladybirds on that day or in that area. You obviously get, if you plot out a map of those records, you get many more around urban areas where there are more people. And if you want to look at trends over time, if, if there are more people getting interested in nature and start recording nature, you're obviously getting more records. So you need to do some quite sophisticated statistical analysis to understand, unpick from that data, what are the changes over time? But that's been done as part of these state of nature reports. There's one in 2016, and there's one more recently in 2019. A whole range of wildlife organizations get involved in either providing data or helping with the analysis. Um, and this data, you know, show a worrying trend overall, I guess, basically, is the, is the headline message. About 15% of species of 8,000 species studied were sort of threatened um, with extinction. And the majority of species that show a change, there, there are many more declines than, than increases. So it really paints a worrying picture of the nation's wildlife. So this is all a bit doom and gloom. And, and you know, I went into a career in ecology wanting to you know, make a difference. This is all about kind of articulating the decline of nature. Um, and then you want to think about, okay, how do we revert that? How do we change, you know, change it and, and, and restore biodiversity? So this is an experiment I got involved in in, in Port and Down, which is in Wiltshire. And, uh, you know, these, these, what's called a field margin can be planted with um, wildflower seeds. And the idea is that these can potentially allow species to move through landscapes and, and in, improve the connectivity of those landscapes. Um, so a whole lot of effort goes into this and there, there's whole, you know, journal papers and people, you know, symposia at conferences about understanding how we can essentially configure these little field margins to try to reverse biodiversity decline. But actually the, the elephant in the room is that most of our landscapes look like this. I mean, if you look at the statistics, 70% um, of land in, in the UK is arable or improved grassland. So that's the intensive wheat crops, oilseed rape, um, you know, intense pasture that's not really got any space for biodiversity. For example, there's only 1% of neutral or calcareous grassland that, that many of our, you know, butterfly or bird populations or plant populations need. That's the elephant in the room is, you know, the huge amounts of land we're devoting to intensive food production. And actually, you know, working to configure these margins is literally just tinkering at the margins of the problem. So the question then becomes, how do we transform this intensive food production system? So you can see what, what the issue is here. It's, it's responsible for, as I mentioned, you know, um, malnourishment, uh, over, you know, obesity, overweight, biodiversity loss, quarter of greenhouse gas emissions, um, water extraction, reducing water availability, reducing water quality in many cases through chemical pollution, and um, 
also associated with zoonotic diseases. In fact, you know, the COVID-19 disease is thought to be exacerbated by land use degradation. Uh, many of these zoonotic diseases uh, arise through our increasing human wildlife interaction through through you know destroying primary habitats for cattle ranching or growing palm oil etc so we need to transform this food system that's widely recognized and we set about exploring in a workshop that I was lucky enough to be involved in with a range of different sort of disciplinary um, people from disciplinary backgrounds. So we weren't just ecologists, we had people from business school, from uh, political sciences, from agriculture, from economics, as well as biological sciences. And we're trying to understand the factors that prevent you transforming the food system. So if you think of this complex food system, not just the production of food, but you know the transport of food, the retail, the, the packaging, this complex network of economic interactions, but also social interactions. How do you suddenly transform it from one state to one, to another state, which is less damaging to to our planet's you know environment and our own um, ability to persist on this planet in the longer term? And initially, when we started this workshop, it was interesting because some people said it's about essentially it's about the economy. Stupid, what they were saying. It's about the economy. Uh, you know, it's about us paying farmers to farm in the way they do. And you know we subsidise them, provide subsidies for them to to manage land in in a certain way. But actually, when we really got down to it, you know, subsidies was was one of the things mentioned. But there are a whole range of other factors, and we kind of broke them down into different sets of constraints. So some relate to um, knowledge constraints. So, for example, you know, a lack of recognition of environmental impacts. You know, a retailer might want to be, you know stock sustainable produce, but it's very difficult to look at a, a, you know something and say well what are the carbon emissions what's the biodiversity impact how much embedded water in this product as i mentioned economic and regulatory constraints are important you know perverse subsidies are a big one you know we pay farmers to farm in a way which is actually keep the land in a farmable state which has been very bad for biodiversity another one is um less less well considered i suppose are biophysical constraints so in this case for example we might have We've, we've used so many pesticides over the years that we've actually destroyed a lot of our natural enemies that would that eat crop pests. So the ladybirds, spiders, uh, ground beetles. And actually, if we want to farm in a way which is free of pesticides, we're now kind of, we can't until we restore those populations. So we're kind of locked in to using these chemical pesticides. But another set of constraints here is this, this kind of pinky color or orangey color, social cultural constraints. And these relate more to I guess psychology, sociology, even philosophy. And the one obviously I'm talking about today in particular is our sense of limited collective identity and how, you know, as consumers, you know, if we, at the most basic level, if we have a strong sense of, of um, uh, if we're very far down that individualistic spectrum to the extent that we're very selfish, then we, we don't really care about what we buy or its impacts on the other side of the world, on other species. So that limited collective identity is, is one of the big factors which is, is you know, affecting these environmental problems because one of the big drivers is how we choose to travel, what we choose to buy. And that's strongly affected by our, our collective identity. <clears throat> so just coming back to wrapping up this section on sustainability, some of these big global problems, you know, biodiversity loss, climate change. We often think that they're kind of, you know, they're daunting, obviously they're daunting. And people talk about the solutions being at the level of, you know, institutions. So we need to implement a carbon tax. We need to put a new regulation in place. And of course we need those things, but actually we all equally need changes in mindsets. So that the kind of social cultural factors, we need to think about how we can change our worldviews because those worldviews are massively important in driving on sustainable consumption but also if you think about it those institutions you know whether it's our economic institutions our justice systems our legal frameworks they're actually just made up of our world views past and present and if you want to change those institutions you need to change people's mindsets and their world views so actually these big problems these big systemic problems which seem so daunting and there's an opportunity because the solutions lie you know with with, with us in our minds right now So I've talked about those three topics and I saved the last one. I, I kind of allowed you to vote on the others. Um, and I'm just gonna, this one off here to, 
to talk about the last one, which is about practice and introspection. So this talk is a mix of, I guess, form and formlessness in the sense that I, I kept this structure so I could talk about this one at the end, because this is not quite an academic discipline, as it were. We've talked about biology, sustainability, psychology, um, and there are a whole range of other disciplines that could be explored and have relevance to the self-delusion. But actually, it's not all about academic knowledge. So firstly, to say, if we do study interdiscipline, interdisciplinarity and, and, and try to build the bridges across disciplines, one important thing to do is to not work too hard at the detail sometimes. You know, we, we can read a lot into these topics, but also give, give your mind, if I'd have one recommendation, is to give your mind some, you know, rest as well. You know, in between the times when we're reading into a topic deeply, you know, whether it's we're going for a walk or baking a cake or painting a picture, your subconscious mind is still working to integrate that information because it's pointless to gather all this random information if it can if it's not integrated in your mind into some holistic coherent framework so rest and sleep are very important for actually doing that equally knowledge about things you know just abstract knowledge is not very useful unless we can also you know have a deeper knowledge of something and that experiential knowledge is also important especially when we're talking about a, top, a topic like the self or you know the self illusion then actually what better way to also study it through more introspective approaches and so you know whether that's critically analyzing our own thoughts and and processes and that can be done in a kind of you know uh, a sort of rational critical thinking way or it can be done in a more of a sort of a practice based way like a sort of meditation type approaches lots of evidence now showing that a good book for example is the science of meditation by daniel goleman um, pulling together scientific research to show that meditation, mindfulness, <laughs> passively observing the, pro the thought processes actually changes the neural networks in your brain and changes the way your, your brain works and makes people less egotistical and shifts people along that spectrum to the boundaries between our a sense of self as discrete entities kind of start to dissolve. And that leads to a whole set of changes, like more compassion, more empathy, as well as more pro-social behaviours. So, you know, those those approaches are important. There, I mean, there are other approaches, of course, to um, change our sense of self, whether it's in some for some people, it might be engaging in sort of community based practices, you know, especially outdoor type event uh, activities. Um, for others, it might be you know, going and engaging with nature, like deeply observing nature. Everyone's sort of different as to what approach works best for them. The key thing is the practice here, I guess. <laughs> Just to give an analogy is, if you think of an Olympic archer um, firing an arrow 100 meters away, right into the target, hitting the red, the bullseye, you know, a fantastic feat. Now, if I was to understand that theoretically, perfectly, you know, I the exact movements, how everything works, I still wouldn't be able to go and do it. It requires obviously hours and hours of practice because that practice changes the neural um, setup. You know, um, neurons that wire together, fire together in the words of, words of Donald Hebbs. Essentially, you know, by practicing something, we're changing the, the, uh, the configurations of those neural networks and making that more easy and more likely next time. And it's similar for how we think, you know, we think in a certain way because we've, we've, it becomes a habit. And if we want to change the way we think, we need to actually practice at laying down different, uh, different pathways of thought. And that's why these practice based approaches are, are, are really important for changing our perspective and our worldview. So I guess just to sort of summarize, you know, theoretical knowledge is really good. And actually that can be good because we, when we start to see there is an illusion, then we might become more motivated to then engage in some practice-based uh, pursuits to try to sort of overcome the, the overcome that illusion in terms of the way we think. So I'm going to end on one slide now, I guess, because it would be remiss of me not to talk about all the other disciplinary approaches that can be taken. And this is, of course, not an exhaustive list. And I'd be really interested to hear from people if there are other perspectives on this topic beyond the ones mentioned here, because, you know, it's really nice to hear about different things that are going on. Um, you know, you, for example, you could study technology studies with a, with a lens on the self-delusion. I've talked a bit about innovation, you know, inventions and how they happen. There's a nice book called Rebel Wisdom on, on that. 
AI design, um, Templeton World Charity Foundation are actually funding Buddhist scholars to get involved in the design of AI technology. Because if, if, if the sense of self as an isolated entity is an illusion, you know, should we be programming that into AI? That's an interesting question, I think. Um, anthropology, a, a, a different topic in terms of there's some really nice work looking at how Western cultures have a very different sense of identity and more object oriented view of the world, abstract thinking versus more traditionally Eastern cultures. This is this geography of thought a work by Richard Nisbet. Also some nice work by more looking at further back, more indigenous cultures, um, David Abrams' work as, as well as many others. I th it's, it's very easy to sort of, I suppose, be kind of arrogant in the modern world and think all our sort of advanced knowledge is got, you know, there's nothing we can learn from old cultures, but actually, you know, in terms of wisdom, in terms of ways of seeing the world, there's there's still a lot we could learn. I think we're certainly we're probably in some respects you could argue we're going backwards in in some cases. Uh, religion, you know, especially topics like uh, you know religions like Buddhism, where there's a really analytic, you know, a, quite a, a coherent framework for a lot of the things I've talked about. You know, interconnectivity and and the concepts of of um, a more expansive sense of self. And there's some nice books link, taking a scientific approach to Buddhism. Um, fiction books. Fiction is important for perspective taking, um, which is good for empathy. There are also some books like Richard Power's Overstory, talking more about ecological connectivity. Um, there are also some nice books, can be like warnings, I guess, of going too far down that spectrum, either towards individualism, you know, will become overly selfish and nationalistic and xenophobic like books like the wall where we treat you know anyone outside of our in-group has just called the others and we put big machine guns on walls to keep them out um, but equally at the other end of the spectrum the dangers of becoming idealistic about a kind of communitarian collectivist society this book we by Yevgeny Zamyatin and then in political history, I haven't read this last one yet, Richard Putnam's recent book, but this documents how American culture has changed from being much more group oriented to rapid increases in individualism over recent decades. And then he's making the case that it's hit an inflection point now. And across a broad range of sort of intellectual disciplines, we're starting to see this inflection where essentially individualism is, is dead and there's a new, more collective sense of, of urgency. And that's reflected in this book, uh, again, a more recent one, Greed is Dead by, these are two mainstream economists, really distinguished economists, talking about how essentially our individualistic system is, is, um, is at its end point. So I think this is really interesting times, and um, I hope you've enjoyed the talk. And yeah, it'd be great to get um, questions and uh, further interaction. Um, just a kind of infographic here on the left, some of the things I've talked about, some kind of factoids, as it were, for how, you know, the, the body and the self is much more porous than we might intuitively think. Flows of information, energy, matter passing through us all the time. Um, and of course, the, the book, if, it'd be great if, if you're interested to read it. And one thing is there's a survey associated with the book. And I really be, yeah, um, thankful if people would have a go at that before and if they do read the book have a go at the survey before and after because that allows us to kind of more rigorously assess the degree to which the book can change mindsets and we can you know take this more evidence-based approach to some of these interventions um, so you can scan that qr code and that takes you to the infographic if you want to have a look at that or share it with people that'd be great as well so yeah i hope you've enjoyed it and um, look forward to to some discussion either now or or via email as well um, Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, very much. Professor Oliver. Um, okay. Yeah, I think I think you really bridged the gap to some of us about like the importance of interdisciplinary work um, by taking us through all those different sort of areas. Um, so now um, we'll have a Q and A. So if you have any questions, uh, please do put them either in the chat or send them to me. Um, if you want to ask the questions yourself, please um, feel free to raise hand, and then we can we can let you um, unmute and ask them yourself. So um, did we, I have a couple of questions um, just sent to me directly. So I'll start off with them. Right, yeah. Um, so 
the one of the questions is about the studies in which you were showing um, individualism. So, so how do these studies exactly define it? Um, so especially in in like non-democratic countries where there might be difficulty in sort of translating the questions, which might be responsible for some of the like effects or trends we see. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the Santos paper is looking at two aspects, individualistic um, practices and individualistic values. And they have to use sort of proxies for that. So things like individualistic practices are things like whether um, people live on their own or not. Uh, or you know the the frequency of divorce in a society. Now, obviously, you can imagine there's some issues with that. For example, you know you might li more live on your own if you can afford it. <laughs> so it's not really necessarily about your preferences, but it's more about your capacity to do so. So all these these issues, these sort of um, metrics have flaws. And as I said, there are nuances in a lot of these studies in how they try to capture that. Um, and so they try to account for socioeconomic status and things like like that in the in the studies um there are also some other interesting metrics so for example um michelle gelfand um has some interesting work on what a concept they call tightness and looseness in societies and the idea is that um when a country faces environmental shocks then then um the society become becomes a lot tighter uh, it becomes more rule-based, um, more strict, more likely to elect authoritarian leaders. Um, and you see that perhaps happening in, with many sort of shocks recently in geopolitical events. Also, there's a, they've had a recent paper out just last week, I think, linking that to pandemics and showing that, that, that looser countries have done worse in the, in the pandemic. So their idea is that this is almost like a, a, an ap adaptation at the kind of societal level to, to kind of you know not an, not a biological adaptation obviously but a kind of cultural adaptation to deal with with strife and 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 shocks um now again in in those studies coming back to the question there are a number of issues with how you define looseness and tightness um i guess i can't answer it comprehensively but each study is particular i would encourage you to sort of be critical with how you know and, and really go to the primary literature and, and and look at some of the potential caveats. But I think there is a, a clear weight of evidence behind a lot of these trends in individualism because they come from many different um, studies and many different ways of quantifying individualism. Right, yeah, thank you. Um, we have another question. So, so th this is about, yeah, so, I'll just read it out because it's so even with an extended in group, how would an individual best discern what's best for that group? Um, one can make the case that extending this in group is not realistic and ignores the natural human tendency to focus on smaller groups around them. Yeah, I think I, I struggle with this myself and I don't have the answer because, you know, is it idealistic to think that we will all develop this global identity. Um, I, you know, I don't think it is to the extent that it, that we will genuinely. Well, for start, we won't lose our, our our smaller identity. And actually, there's some nice work showing that um, this this. So interestingly, different psycholo psychology fields of psychology come up with different sort of wording for this sense of a more collective sense of identity. And this paper uses the term metapersonal with the idea that you have a kind of individualistic sense of self as a kind of egoic sense of self, but then you have the metapersonal above that, which is essentially the same of what I described, this kind of ecological sense of self. And interestingly, this paper shows that um, when people have an individualistic sense of self, a smaller sense of self, as it were, they don't associate with the, the metapersonal. They score lower on the kind of indices that kind of score that. But when they have the metapersonal, they don't lose the individualistic sense of self. It just becomes another lens. So you can almost flip between the metapersonal and the more egoic sense of self. So it's almost like it becomes like a Russian doll. So you're kind of, you build your personality outwards. You don't lose the core essentially. And you just retain the flexibility to look at things from a different perspective. So I think when you look at it like that, the, 
you know, the, the evolution of our consciousness to be more mindful of those impacts and, and kind of have a more global sense of responsibility, I think is, is feasible. Um, and I, I think, yeah, if you think about how we identify, you know, we identify with our family and we identify sometimes with our town or with our county and with, with our country a lot. But also, you know, we identify with supranational organizations like Europe or even a global citizenship. And it's interesting, you can ask people, um, so in fact, I do the survey for my book, to what extent do you identify, you know, what's, what level do you identify with, with most? And yeah, obviously if people voted for Brexit, for example, they probably maybe identified more with the national level than with the European level. Um, but I think the more we can get people to start thinking about global citizenship, I think the more likely we are to address some of these, these big problems. Um, and that doesn't mean we need to lose our, how we care about our local area or our town. I think we can, we can kind of focus on both at the same time. Yeah, that, that was very insightful. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, so um, this, this is just one of the factors which is sort of in the broad framework you're talking about. Uh, so what's your opinion on the issue of food wastage in developed countries where people might not think twice before throwing away less pricey foods? And how would you encourage people to change this? And it's, what kind of a role does it play in sort of the broader context of um, the self and the planet? Yeah, I mean, food waste is a, is a big issue because, you know, um, if we can reduce our demands that we have upon the biosphere then that's a big a big um a really key element to this um there's a big focus in environmental science in the uk about kind of quantifying natural capital uh, and measuring how much natural capital we've got and trying to optimize how we manage our land but actually the demand thing is key and you know and things like reducing food waste and buying sustainably are, are obviously really important um i guess what there's clear evidence, as I mentioned, that when people have that more, um, that broader sense of, of identity and responsibility, it goes hand in hand with those pro-environmental behaviours. So they reduce the food waste, uh, for example, and they a whole set of other environmental behaviours. So I think that's the sort of key behavioural lever is, is, that the, is, is trying to change the way people think about their identity. But hand in hand, you also have other interventions at the social or sort of structural level. Uh, and that's, you know, can be, um, yeah, d different uh, regulations or making things easier in terms of, um, you know, there, there are lots of different approaches, I guess, that need to be implemented hand in hand. It's not all about mindsets and it's not all about, you know, getting the prices right or, um, you know, changing institutional organization. And I guess a bit like the, the, the food systems example that I gave, you know, if you work on any of those lock-in mechanisms individually, you're unlikely to be effective because you're only working on one part of the factors that's locking in the system. You kind of need to work on them all together in a co coordinated way. So I think that's where, you know, for, for a topic like food waste, it would be great to go and say, well, what are the, constraints that are you know preventing us um, wasting less food and some of those will be structural and some of them will be knowledge based and some of them will be at the more level of kind of mindsets and worldviews and then you can kind of come up with a coherent strategy to tackle those yeah yeah and and like on, on that point I, I really liked your insight where you kind of said that our laws today are just a product of our biases um, and that to actually change the laws, we have to sort of change people's perception. And that can be done by sort of thinking about a global network. And um, so it's slightly, <laughs> slightly negatively framed, but I, I remember like Max Planck's sort of quip that science progresses one funeral at a time. Would you say the same thing about this kind of the, the issue of sustainability, biodiversity, climate change, and so on? 
is it more about sort of educating the next generation rather than sort of converting the present or sort of yeah yeah no i think that's <clears throat> some some interesting things to think about there because i i mean we have we all have neuroplasticity where we can change the way we think and we can overcome bad habits but equally there is some degree that um, we learn more when we're younger and we're more you know flexible so you know if you wanted to teach someone piano it'd be easier to teach someone who's younger and learning yeah. than someone who's sort of 80 years old or something and i think that's obviously likely to be true about our kind of world views as well and there's a real opportunity that and this is why I, i've become much more optimistic because when you look at you know, when you work in environmental sciences, it can become quite sort of doom and gloom just hearing about all this decline of biodiversity, ocean acidification, pollution, etc. But actually, and it seems like, and then you look at the trends in individualism that have just been going up over time and narcissism. But actually, there is some evidence that we might be starting to see a kind of end point. And you have organisations like, you know, the school climate strikes, where you've got kids, you know, taking themselves out of school and arguably you know impacting their education but but to stand up for something bigger than themselves they see themselves i guess as more you know global citizens in that sense then you've got groups like extinction rebellion and there seems to be a change in in kind of consciousness towards a much more uh kind of yeah a positive change to a more sort of group identity at that level and i think we, we may be seeing that that change and especially with with young people coming into the world who then uh, maybe adopt that view you can get some very rapid changes i guess the other way you get a social tipping point is because we are connected psychologically um you know through social networks for example obesity voting preferences a taste in music you can influence someone who you have never even met you know through a social network and so when someone changes their mindset that can kind of cascade and affect many others and so you kind of get these these rapid changes that it might all seem everything's doom and gloom, but actually in two years, you know, you could get some very rapid changes perhaps. Yeah, I think I think it's it's good for us to have a bit of a bit of positivity <laughs> at this time. Um another another interesting question here. So how did you personally transition from a sort of very zoology, ecology background to this this idea of the self-delusion, the interdisciplinary work? Yeah, so I, I always had an interest in I guess sort of um, philosophy and, and sort of Eastern religion, you know, I used to go to the library after school and read things about sort of Buddhism and Zen and things like, you know, religions like that, which are very much about kind of, um, yeah, introspective approaches to kind of understanding our sense of self. I was also interested in biology and um, I used to live in Malaysia and look at these little weaver ants and really fascinated by kind of, you know these ants pulling building nests with their, their little larva using them as glue and just the kind of that that really prompted my interest in nature and that i guess led to the zoology degree um i think and not just i've got to z in ucas form and didn't know where to go and pick the last topic um but actually as i sort of talked about a bit i i started to realize that you, the ecological problems or the environmental problems you know aren't actually solved in ecology they're actually some of the solutions lie in psychology or they lie in economics or they lie in philosophy or even ethics you know so i think when you're really interested in addressing these problems so protect you know so i suppose yeah if you if you're as an environmentalist you might end up going into some of these other topics to really find the the solution and i guess the self-delusion book is a kind of marriage of those two elements of kind of trying to think about environmental sustainability and get to the real root causes and the, the deeper solutions and then also that kind of interest in in sort of um philosophy and i guess spirituality in a sense of an evidence-based spirituality as well thank you um so if there are any last minute questions please feel free to um put them in the chat but if not, then I think we will um, wrap up here. So thank you everyone for coming. And thank you, Professor Oliver, for your fantastic talk and agreeing to spend some time with us today. Um, 
And yeah, so if any if anyone could please put their feedback on the Slido, um, we still have the link in the chat. That would be great. But yeah, thank you, Professor Oliver. No, thank you. Yeah, thanks for thanks for inviting me. And yeah, obviously wanted to get this acknowledgement slide up of people I've worked with on on these ideas as well. But yeah, um, I really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, uh, please feel free to get in touch by email or or whatever, because um, it's really nice to kind of keep some of these engagements going and hear about, as I mentioned, different disciplines that kind of feed into this topic. I'm really fascinated by. So thanks for your time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we can 